All right. Well, hello and welcome to this evening's webinar, AAII Growth Investing Open House, led by Wayne Thorpe and moderated by Derek Hagman. Thank you so much for joining us. We are happy to have you all here. My name is Jenna Brashear and I'll be your host for tonight. A few things to go over before we begin. I always want to remind you know, all of our webinar viewers that AAII is a nonprofit educational group and is not a financial advisor and thus is not able to give personal advice. Every investor is different. That's why our goal with each broadcast and article is to educate you on how to make better financial decisions. And a handout of the pre presentation is available under the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, which is located on the right hand side of your screen. And if you have questions uh, for our speaker during the presentation, please submit them anytime uh, using the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. And our moderator will select questions submitted and read them aloud for the benefit of all watching the broadcast. And questions that are not selected for the broadcast will be reviewed and addressed afterwards. And if you experience any issues with the audio or the video of the webinar, please consult the instructions on how to change your device's settings or consult the GoToWebinar website for support at gotowebinar.com. And just a friendly reminder that this presentation is recorded and a replay of the webinar will be available tomorrow on AAII's YouTube channel, along with links to the presentation's handouts and any resources that we discuss. Uh, and the PDF is also available at aaii.com slash webinars tomorrow afternoon. And for new viewers, uh, we'd like to give a little background about our organization. The American Association of Individual Investors is an independent nonprofit corporation formed in 1978 for the purpose of assisting individuals in becoming effective managers of their own assets through programs of education, information, and research. And with that, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Derek. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, and hello and welcome uh, to everyone to our live event. I think it's going to be a very educational evening as we are going to discover AAII's newest premium product uh, through tonight's AAII Growth Investing Open House. My name is Derek Hageman. I'm a financial analyst at AAII and editor of AAII's Dividend Investing Service, and I'll be serving as tonight's moderator. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Wayne Thorpe. And Wayne certainly wears a lot of different hats at AAII. Among numerous distinctions, Wayne is the creator, lead analyst, and editor of the AAII Growth Investing Newsletter. He is also a senior financial analyst and a vice president at AAII. Welcome, Wayne, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Derek, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for playing injured tonight. Uh, Derek's a little bit under the weather. Uh, so uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you uh, you coming out, and uh, thank you to uh, also to to Jenna. Well, you did you did say it was uh, my chance to get on radio. You said I had a nice deep voice, so uh, I, I sent in my audition tapes uh, earlier today. So well, fingers crossed. <laughs> Sounds good. And actually, uh, thank you. Before we get started, I just uh, wanted to thank Wayne. He's uh, one of his favorite holidays uh, is coming up next week, which is Thanksgiving. And he's going to be heading home to uh, Michigan. And uh, I, I managed to pry out Wayne's secret, secret brine recipe for uh, a turkey. So I uh, thank you for that. And maybe, My pleasure, if, Derek. Uh, maybe if participants are lucky enough and they email you, maybe you'll share it with them. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, once you go, Brian, you never go back. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a firm believer. So if anyone's interested, I'd be willing to share and spread that Thanksgiving cheer. Awesome. Well, just a reminder, I know Jenna uh, uh, discussed this already, but if you do have questions for Wayne, Please submit them using the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel, and Wayne will be answering questions throughout the presentation. And with that, uh, please take it away, Wayne. Well, thank you very much, Derek, and welcome everyone uh, tonight to tonight's AI Growth Investing Open House. Uh, so yes, you can submit questions through the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, but also here on the first slide, uh, you know, inevitably, at least for my in my case. I often, when I attend a, a presentation, always have questions after the fact. So if you do have a question after the fact, feel free to reach out to me at wayne at aaii.com uh, and I'd be more than willing to, to try to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, but again, thank you. Welcome everyone. 
Uh, so just an overview of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, introduce the growth investing strategy. I'm sure that's why most of you are here tonight to learn about uh, the strategy itself. Uh, and I'll be talking about the growth grade and the G-score that really form the cornerstone of the growth investing strategy. Uh, talk about the addition and, uh, addition and deletion criteria that I use to manage the portfolio. Also talk about how growth investing fits in amongst the other AI portfolios that are out there. Inevitably, you've probably heard uh, of our shadow stock portfolio, uh, Derek's uh, dividend investing portfolio, the stock superstars report in VMQ. And sort of how does that, how does growth investing fit into those portfolios? Uh, and how does growth investing, does, that, does it fit into your own uh, investment uh, strategy and your overall portfolio? Uh, and then lastly, I want to wrap up with an overview of the growth investing website. Uh, I want to give you a sneak peek uh, of the growth investing portfolio. Now, this is a webinar, I mean, an open house. Um, so, uh, and uh, growth investing uh, is a premium product. So uh, just managing expectations. I won't be flinging uh, the doors completely wide open this evening, uh, but I will give you hopefully uh, at least a taste uh, of what the types of stocks we're investing in uh, and things like that. Uh, walk you through our growth ideas, which are sort of extra uh, investment opportunities following the growth strategy, as well as walking you through uh, stock analysis using uh, the growth analyzer that we built for growth uh, investing. <clears throat> and then lastly, a Q&A session. Hopefully, I'll be able to wrap this up in about a half hour, 40 minutes, leave some time for Q&A. Uh, can go until probably a little bit after 10 o'clock, uh, 10, 10 minutes after the hour. Um, but again, feel free to ask questions as we go or submit any questions uh, after the fact. So, I mean, really to lead things off, you know, why growth now? Uh, you know, it, uh, it's either a, a bit of hubris or uh, maybe a, a little crazy or a little bit of both uh, to be launching a, a growth investing newsletter uh, right when growth is, is going through a, a Bit of a down slump uh, this year, uh, especially relative to uh, value. Uh, but you know what really led me down the path to try to develop a growth-oriented stock selection strategy? It really was the who and not the what. Uh, and the who are growth are AI members. Uh, on an annual basis, uh, AI surveys their members, and one of the questions that we always ask is, "What is their preferred investment style?" And you know, year in and year out, nearly half of our members state that growth is their preferred strategy. So our members are interested in growth investing. So there is a need. There was a need out there amongst our members. So then, you know, we started looking at uh, our other AI model portfolios, and I'll be touching on those uh, a little more in depth a little bit later. But you know, we have our AI shadow stock portfolio, the stock superstars report, dividend investing, and VMQ stocks. And none of these portfolios really have what I would consider to be a pure growth component. Uh, so, you know, there was a, a need amongst our members. We had a hole that really an un, unfulfilled need uh, based on our other portfolios. Uh, so, you know, we thought, okay, well, this might be something to, that we need to look into. But, you know, one of the problems I faced is that growth tends to underperform over the long term. You know, I, I consider myself a little bit more of a value investor. There is a significant amount uh, of research out there that shows over the long term uh, value does outperform growth. But, you know, looking at uh, the way in which growth is typically defined, it's sort of the, the opposite end of, of value. So basically, it's high price to book stocks. That's really all they're looking at when they define a quote unquote growth portfolio. Uh, so it's like, you know, from an academic sense, you know, that necessarily really doesn't well define growth. Uh, so then I'm thinking, you know, well, are most are, are the typical growth investing strategy, perhaps they're just doing it wrong. Uh, and that might sound a little arrogant, but you know, that's one of the reasons why AI, I mean, I've been with the association for 25 years, and I think people that have been familiar with the organization know that we tend to lean more towards value orientation. But that's because we really hadn't found a growth strategy that we thought sort of overcame a lot of the issues that we had with growth investing. And so that's what I set out to do is to try to come up with a growth investment approach that attempts to do growth investing right. So, you know, irrespective, and I'm not a market timer, um, you know, 
so I can't tell you, you know, growth hasn't had a good year, hasn't really had a for the last 12 months or so. But prior to that, over the last you know, 12, 15 years, growth has been soundly defeating value. So I can't tell you how long this underperformance relative to value is going to last. Um, you know, it could have, you know, we've had a bit of a, a rebound in growth over the last week or so. Who knows if we found a bottom? I don't try to play that game. You know, I'm not trying to time the market. So I believe that no matter if growth or value is performing better, you know, there's always like, some compelling investment opportunities throughout the market cycle. Uh, so, you know, I believe that the key is to find a reasoned approach that resonates with you, meets your investment time frame, your risk profile, et cetera. And it's a strategy that you can follow in a disciplined way. And whether that's growth, or value, there are still, I think, going to be opportunities uh, that will arise no matter where we are in the market uh, or economic cycle. But my goal in trying to create, uh, when I was creating the growth investment strategy, was to find a growth investing approach that overcame a lot of the shortfalls that many growth-oriented approaches have. First and foremost is so many growth-oriented ori approaches are looking, when they're looking for growth, they're looking for the absolute best growth, the highest growth. And I, I mean, I've done, I did research, did analysis, did back testing through this process. And I found that, you know, looking for the highest level of growth is actually the, is almost as bad as looking for the worst growth. Um, you know, I did back testing that showed that if you look at, if you identify stocks and pick stocks that are in the top 20%, uh, uh, based on long-term growth and the bottom 20% based on long-term growth, over a 20-year backtesting period, those groups of companies performed almost exactly the same, and they were by far the worst performing stocks. So instead, I started looking for a, an approach that looked for consistent, sustainable growth. Uh, and on top of that, I'm looking for a history of profitability and cash flow generation, as well as fundamental factors <clears throat> that indicate quality growth going forward. So, you know, I'm sure another question that a lot of you have is, is growth investing right for you? Now, first and foremost, this portfolio is geared towards people that are looking, uh, investors that are looking for capital appreciation versus dividend income. If you are looking solely for dividend income, then you might want to look into Derek's uh, dividend investing portfolio. Uh, you know, there, I think, out of his, uh, the 20 stock portfolio that is the growth investing portfolio, I believe there are five stocks, five or six stocks that pay dividends. Uh, so I don't exclude companies that pay a dividend, but certainly not actively seeking them out. So any dividend income that's generated by this portfolio is purely incidental. Now, <clears throat> I mean, as investors, we're always hearing about diversification. You know, sort of simple diversification is looking at, you know, investing across different sectors and industries. But pure uh, portfolio diversification spans not only industries and sectors, but also delves into more investment styles. So that's when you get into, you know, momentum, growth, value, et cetera. And if you're looking for a growth component to your stock portfolio, then growth investing, I think, definitely is, is an element uh, as a portfolio that would satisfy that need. But you know, it's important to point out that this is a, a concentrated portfolio. And you know, this is actually, I uh, purchased the last two stocks out of the 20 stock portfolio today, uh, was investing into the full 20 stocks over about three weeks. And so bought the last two stocks today. So the stock, the, the growth investing portfolio is fully invested in 20 stocks. And this is the, breakdown of, of the current portfolio uh, as of early this probably late morning early afternoon so you can see that this is definitely a concentrated portfolio you know half of it is in technology you got 20 percent in consumer cyclicals 14 percent in healthcare. you got a smattering then in consumer uh, defensive industrials and financial services you can also see that by and large this is a large cap portfolio uh, so roughly, probably about 80, 85% of the portfolio are large cap, uh, actually 86.3% to be exact, of the portfolio uh, are large cap stocks, the rest are mid caps. Uh, and, you know, I was actually talking with John Bakovsky, the president of the uh, AI today, and he was asking me why I thought that that was as far as the size 
element. I do not have an explicit market cap requirement for the portfolio. Uh, initially, I was looking for stocks uh, of at least a $400 million market cap. Um, but I, what I'm finding is the stocks that are passing this portfolio, uh, this, this, the, uh, the screen that I have set up for this portfolio, that never comes into play. And I think part of the reason why is these companies are established uh, based on the underlying fundamental criteria that are required that we analyze for these stocks. They have to be in existence for at least five years. And then I think you know the fact that they are consistently growing, generating positive cash from operations, as well as are relatively high quality, I think those elements are also attracting uh, investors into them. And that's why these stocks tend to be uh, mid to large cap firms. So now I wanna get into really the meat and potatoes of this uh, discussion and really start talking about the overall growth investing strategy. And there are really two key components uh, of the growth investing strategy. The first is the AAII A plus growth grade, and the other is the G-score or Monerham's G-score. Now the growth grade rewards companies with strong and sustainable growth, and that's the key, strong and sustainable growth, not the highest absolute growth. Higher grades are also awarded when it, for companies that have a history of annual cash from operations, positive cash from operations, as well as year over year sales growth. And you know what I went to alluded to initially was what I really have started doing was trying to find a better growth grade. Uh, for those of you that subscribe to either plat, uh, are familiar with either our platinum or our A plus uh, services, uh, the A plus stock grades uh, are our stock grades. Uh, factor-based stock grades that uh, help you perform a more objective uh, analysis of individual stocks. And we had a growth grade, um, but it was actually rewarding stocks that had the absolute highest growth. And when I started doing my analysis, I found that it was really those companies in that sort of sweet spot, middle 60% of stocks uh, based on long-term growth, uh, sales growth, that actually performed the best. So the first step uh, of really coming up with this overall strategy was to sort of revamp our growth grade and look for companies that are able to sustain their growth over the long term. Uh, and so that was one of the elements that led to this revamped, revised growth grade. The other key cornerstone of the growth investing strategy is Monerham's G-score. Now this is an eight factor model that uses financial statement data to analyze growth companies. And really this is, you know, it's a means of evaluating, you know, the quote unquote quality of a company's growth prospects by looking at elements of profitability, operating stability and accounting conservatism. And I'll be talking about this a little bit later, but uh, you know, it's important, you know, inevitably is gonna come up is, uh, you know, we wanna find companies that are growing, have stable growth, so you know you're, we're looking at the variance uh, of return on assets, variance of annual sales growth. We're also looking at companies that are ex making expenditures that might be hurting their current earnings because of the way in which earnings are calculated. But we're looking for companies that are expending higher levels uh, of R&D, uh, <clears throat> CapEx and advertising relative to their total assets, because this might be hurting earnings in the short term, but these expenditures in theory are gonna help the company grow relative to its competitors going forward. So when we're looking to add stocks to the growth investing portfolio, you know, we have a whole slew of criteria, but the, really the big three I would say are a G score of seven or eight, uh, and again, this is an eight point scale. So either, either a seven or a perfect eight. A growth grade of A, so a score of 81 or higher. So we're only looking for growth grades of A, as well as quality grades of A or B. Uh, and this is an additional, the, the A plus quality grade is, a, is an overlay that we use a lot, that I use a lot. Uh, it's more useful kind of in an exclusionary aspect where when you're looking for companies that have tend to have a low quality grade, uh, you know, not necessarily that the companies that have a quality grade of A or B are necessarily better or longer term, perf better performers long term, but we found that actually 
looking at uh, avoiding companies that have uh, a quality grade of like a D or an F, those significantly underperform. So we're looking at the quality grade more of as an exclusionary to sort of kick out the stinkers uh, that might be lurking out there. Uh, we're also looking for positive year over year sales growth for the latest fiscal quarter. Uh, so basically sales have to have increased uh, for the latest quarter relative to the same quarter uh, a year ago. Positive trailing cash from operations. Uh, so over the last 12 months, a company's cash from operations is positive. Uh, minimum market cap and liquidity requirements. Really, it's more the liquidity requirements. Uh, again, we're not, because of the stocks that are passing, I have not yet had to implement uh, a minimum uh, minim market cap requirement. Uh, and then, you know, up-to-date up -to SEC filings, you know, uh, the, the SEC data, uh, the, the data from 10K and 10Q reports, those are basically, that's the data that's being used to, to run these screens. So you want to make sure that the data is up to date. Otherwise, you're running screens on old data. Uh, so a company might be passing, but if the data is several months old, it might not reflect the current fundamental situation of the company. Uh, and then lastly, we're excluding OTC stocks, REITs, Russian, and Chinese firms. Uh, you know, OTC stocks, you know, just they have different filing requirements, uh, you know, not as liquid, uh, et cetera. You know, REITs mainly because of the, the tax uh, structure, uh, the pass-through arrangements that are required of, OT, of REITs. Uh, and then lastly, just, you know, the, not, not trying to make a political statement just because of the geopolitical environment. Uh, that's why we're excluding Russian and Chinese firms. Now, you know, I've, this is actually the third uh, presentation I've done over the last month or so uh, about growth investing uh, and the growth investing uh, newsletter. And the question has come up quite a bit now, you know, where are the earnings? You know, we're talking about top line growth, cash from operations, uh, et cetera. You know, where are the earnings, either historical earnings growth or forecasted earnings growth? And, you know, earnings really only come into play when we're looking at earnings stability as part of the G-score. Uh, and even then we're looking at return on assets over a five-year period and looking how the return on, annual return on assets for a company fluctuates over time. Um, but we really don't explicitly look at earnings. Uh, and you know, my opinion, and you know, there's a lot of information and data that, that supports this, is that a company needs to produce top-line growth in order to grow earnings. You know, quote unquote, profitable companies can still go bankrupt if they don't generate sufficient cash. So that's why uh, I'm looking, I'm more interested in top line growth and cash from operations. Because really at the end of the day, earnings are an accounting measure impacted by management decisions. Uh, you know, company management can be making assumptions regarding, you know, depreciation scales, uh, you, know, you know, things like that. You know, they have some, they have some guidelines based on gap, but there's still a lot of assumptions um, and, and whatnot that companies can use to, to basically manage, uh, manage earnings. Whereas sales and, and cash, you know, there's really less of an opportunity to, to, to manage those. Uh, and then you know, when we're looking at you know, forward earnings, you know, to, be, to be blunt, analysts aren't the most reliable individuals that are out there. Uh, you know, David Dremen, uh, you know, I really done a lot of his reading. You know, he was one of the forefront of behavioral finance. Uh, you know, he points out and suggests that only one in four analysts correctly estimate future fundamentals within five percentage points. You know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to, I don't want to be uh, putting my money in the hands of people that are at best maybe reliable 25% of the time. Uh, I'll, I'll take my chances, especially when I've developed what I believe is a very sound, uh, rational uh, investment strategy. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's really why earnings uh, aren't, aren't used for this. And I just realized that I have a, use the same statement twice, but I guess just really trying to hit that home that again, analysts, uh, they tend to be uh, overly optimistic. Uh, and even then, you know, they're not very close when it comes to their, their overall estimates. Another question that it comes up as well is, you know, well, are you, you know, what do you do as far as valuation goes? Is this a GARP? portfolio, growth or reasonable price? Are you using some type of a value overlay? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm looking for companies that are generating reasonable and sustainable growth, uh, generating positive cash from operations uh, and have stable year over year sales growth. And you know, 
good, bad, or indifferent, these end up, at least currently, finding companies that have high valuations. So here's slide 10. Uh, you know, I've grayed out. Now, these are the actual 20 companies that are currently a portfolio. Um, because this is a, an open house, um, I did have to, to gray out uh, the actual names of these companies. But these, you know, take my word for it, but I, I am telling the truth. These are the actual value scores, the A-plus value scores. So, you know, these companies are amongst the, the most expensive based on the A-plus value score. Um, you know, and it really, at the end of the day, it makes sense. You know, the companies, these companies have very high expectations. Uh, and that's really, that's warranted based on their track record of consistent growth, cash flows, and quality. Um, you know, a lot of people out there, and I've talked to a lot of our members over the years, and they too, you know, are definitely looking for reasonably priced stocks. So when you see valuations like this, you know, inevitably, you know, that's going to raise some eyebrows. And, and I can appreciate that. But then my counter uh, is this slide, uh, and this is based on data from the Boston Consulting Group uh, and Morgan Stanley Research. And what they did was they looked at basically four factors when selecting stocks. Free cash flow, multiple, which is basically the price multiple, so pre-E, price to book. Uh, the margin, so the profitability of a company, as well as revenue growth. And they looked at that and the impact of using those four elements, selecting stocks, and the impact of those selection methodologies on uh, price performance based on how long your holding, holding period is. So if you have a one-year holding period, which I know very few people that say, you know, I hold it for a year and I get rid of it. But if you do have a one-year uh, holding period, the vast majority of the price performance is driven by the price multiple. Uh, so, you know, that's really, you know, that's why you see such wild swings uh, in high valuation stocks, especially what we've been seeing in the sort of the FANG stocks over the last year. You know, those had the highest multiples. Uh, and so over a short period of time, as those valuations adjust based on uh, being revised expectations, you're going to see significant swings in the price. So not surprising that over a one-year holding period, the multiple is going to be the primary driver of stock price. But the longer your holding period, you see that this yellow part, which is the uh, impact of the multiple on share stock price, the longer your holding period, the less impactful the price multiple is on price performance, to the point where when you get to a 10-year holding period, only 5% of the price performance is being driven by price multiple as a selection criteria. Instead, you see that almost three quarters, well, actually 74, 84, 89% um, of the price performance over a 10 year holding period is being driven by sales or profits, uh, which is basically the cornerstone uh, of the growth investing uh, strategy. And, you know, this came up, I think, in a presentation a, a few weeks ago is, you know, I've been in the business for 25 years. Uh, you know, I, I tend to be a, a little more jaded uh, and it's it's rare that I have aha moments uh, anymore. Um, but when I saw I uh, came across this research probably uh, in the last year or so, uh, right around the time, actually, I think that I started thinking about developing this growth uh, investing strategy. When I saw this, I'm like, wow, I mean, that is, that's huge. Uh, and so, yes, over a one-year period, price multiple is definitely going to have a significant impact. But the whole notion of the growth investing portfolio is to be holding these stocks for multiple years. Uh, you know, I, I very, feel very confident that, you know, the average holding period will be three plus years uh, for these, for these uh, stocks that are in the portfolio. So the longer your holding period, the less impact uh, price multiple as a selection criteria is as uh, on, on stock price. <clears throat> now we talked about the criteria that go into you know, buying a stock. There's a, so much that's written out there. You know, basically it's, it's hard not to go to a financial website these days and say, is, is such and such a stock a, a good buy uh, these days and, and things like that. Not nearly enough is written 
about when to sell. Um, but all AAII model portfolios understand that it's the, 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 the buy decision, uh, the sell decision is just as important as the buy decision. So with that in mind, have a very explicit set of mechanical rules on the addition side and have a very explicit hard and fast set uh, of rules when it comes to deleting stocks from the portfolio. And again, they are driven, you know, a, a good set of sell criteria basically are kind of the mirror uh, of your, your addition criteria. So the three big uh, elements of the sell criteria are the G-score deteriorates. So we has to be seven or above to be added to the portfolio. If the G-score falls to two or lower, it's out. And these are, if any of these happen, it is not or. So if, I mean, it's not and, it's or. So if any of these happen individually, the stock is sold. The growth grade falls to D or lower. Uh, and again, the stock grade has to be an A in order to be added to the portfolio. So if that growth grade weakens from D, from A down to D, we delete it. The quality grade falls to F. Uh, so uh, if you know, it has to be an A or a B to be added to the portfolio, if it weakens to an F, it's gone. If we've seen negative year-over-year -year sales growth for four consecutive quarters, uh, so again, we're looking at same quarter growth. So uh, quarter, uh, you know, the growth from uh, the current quarter to the same quarter uh, a year ago. If a company has four consecutive quarters or year-over-year -year decline in sales, it's out. If the five-year sales growth falls to the bottom 20% uh, of the stock universe, so basically it's, it's, it's no longer a growth company, it is also jettisoned. Uh, trailing cash from operations turns negative. Uh, and then lastly, the only price performance element uh, that I really look at for the growth investing is after being held for three years, if the stock has underperformed the benchmark, which for the this portfolio is the iShares Core S&P 500 ETF or the IVV, if over three years of being held, the stock is underperforming IVV, it is sold as well. So again, if any of these elements uh, is met, uh, it is uh, deleted from the portfolio. So now lastly, before I start really showing you what you can get with growth investing, I do wanna to touch on uh, where growth investing falls uh, amongst uh, our already pretty deep bench of portfolios that we offer here at AII. Um, the nice thing is though, you know, when you look at these portfolios, there's very little overlap uh, from, well, there, as far as stocks go, there's zero overlap, but as far as the elements used to select stocks, there's hardly any overlap compared to our other portfolios. The AI shadow stock portfolio is a deep value. So looking for the bottom 20% of stocks based on price to book uh, and micro cap. So basically I think it's a, now it's a market cap below $400 million. Um, so this is deep value, very small companies. Uh, dividend investing, which again, Derek uh, is the lead analyst and editor of. Uh, Derek is looking for companies that have low or reasonable valuations, as well as a history of earnings and, and dividend growth, along with positive free cash flow that will allow a company, in theory, to be continue paying and growing its dividend going forward. Then we have the Stock Superstars Report, uh, which I was the former editor and uh, also <laughs> can't believe uh, was also helped create that back, you know, 20 some years ago. Uh, you know, the stock superstars report, you know, we're looking for style diversification using four distinct and unique uh, strategies from, from Wall Street gurus. Um, and, you know, tends to be, you know, group one, uh, the O'Neill approach does use price momentum, a little bit of growth, but not to the same elements. That's actually looking for kind of absolute growth uh, there. And then John Neff, who's one of my favorite uh, investors, that is more of a, a GARP uh, strategy where he's also, when he was managing the Magellan Fund, he also, he and his team also looked for companies that were generating reasonable but sustainable uh, growth, um, which so that's one of the reasons why this growth strategy also resonates, resonates very strongly with me when looking for companies that are more in that sweet spot of the middle 60% of long-term sales growth. And then lastly, we have the VMQ stocks portfolio. Now, this is based uh, on academic research uh, that 
in, in creating factors, looking at factors of value, momentum, and quality. Uh, so for the stocks in this portfolio, really the intersection of low valuations and strong, strong price momentum with overlaying that quality uh, element as well, uh, more of an exclusionary aspect. So, you know, we have, uh, again, a very deep bench of portfolios here at AII, but when you look when you look at growth investing relative to our other portfolios, I think that growth investing really stands out as far as its uniqueness uh, and has a very distinct uh, you know, segment uh, of the overall uh, market. So now I want to touch on uh, the, the growth investing website. Uh, if you, it's growth at growth.aai.com. Um, so growth investing is a 20 stock portfolio. And as a subscriber to growth investing, you have access to those 20 stocks that are now fully invested in the portfolio. Uh, you, so you can see exactly what stocks are in there, how they're behaving on a daily basis, uh, as well as underlying fundamental data that'll be updated daily that can help you to see if any of the holdings uh, are nearing a deletion point. We also have the growth ideas list. Uh, these are stocks that meet all of the initial criteria to be added to the growth investing portfolio, but they are not <coughs> they are not in the portfolio currently. Uh, this is the list that when the time comes inevitably, we'll have to, I will have to sell a stock from the portfolio. This ideas list will feed uh, those additions. Uh, so again, these companies meet all of the basic, all the initial criteria, but there's no guarantee that they'll ever be added to the real portfolio. Uh, so if you do buy from that, it's up to you to be able to monitor uh, the different criteria that we used on the sell side and make those make that sell decision yourself. We also have the growth analyzer. You know, inevitably you have stocks that are already in your portfolio. You have stocks on a watch list, et cetera. You know, the growth analyzer will allow you to enter in a stock ticker and perform an analysis within the construct of the growth investing approach to see, you know, how closely that particular stock aligns with the overall strategy. Uh, then on a weekly basis, you get commentary from yours truly, uh, you know, talking about the portfolio, uh, growth investing, you know, the different elements we might be looking at when we're, when we're picking stocks. You know, inevitably, there'll be some macro discussions uh, to boot. But, you know, this is where, you know, I, I try to educate uh, my readers, you know, again, talking about the, the things that I'm looking at when I'm looking at the portfolio uh, and things of that nature. And then lastly, you know, user how-to materials. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time as we were building this uh, newsletter uh, to make sure that we have all of the materials available out there so that someone who comes to growth investing can understand it. And by understanding it, will feel comfortable investing in it. Hey, Wayne, just uh, a couple of questions came in uh, mm -hmm. kind of around the same topic. Um, people are wondering, you know, why 20 stocks? You know, was this arbitrarily determined or did the screens distill it to about 20? Could you just talk more about why, why 20 stocks in the portfolio? Certainly. Uh, that's actually, that's a great question. Um, having managed the stock superstars report, which uh, for at its inception, well, actually at its absolute initial inception, had about 70 or 80 stocks, that then over time, almost immediately, uh, we narrowed that down to 36 and then brought it up to 40 when we did a reboot of it a few years ago. Um, then, you know, Derek, I believe dividend investing uh, is 24 stocks, is that correct? That's correct. Yep. And then VMQ is 20. Um, and, you know, it is somewhat arbitrary, but it's also based on feedback from our from our members that really a 20 stock portfolio probably is still a bit of a reach for uh, for a lot of investors, but anything beyond that just becomes uh, noise. So it's, it's trying to find that sweet spot between giving people enough stocks that they can you know pick and choose and have, have a bit of a choice, but not so many that they're sort of con confronted with uh, analysis paralysis. So that's how we ended up at, at, at 20. But then, uh, and I'll show you that in just a moment, uh, the ideas list has, uh, I think currently around 35 or 40 stocks. Uh, so all told, you've, there's roughly uh, 60 to 65 stocks 
that um, are either in the portfolio or meet the initial selection criteria. So this is the growth investing website. Uh, you know, it's you know very similar in layout. If you if you're familiar with any of the other uh, model portfolio newsletters that we have out there, um, but this is the this is the initial portfolio, uh, the initial homepage. So it gives you the the latest commentary that I've written, uh, access to our full archive of commentary. Uh, you know, performance. Uh, so you know, we we launched the portfolio. I made the first buys for the portfolio. Uh, on Thursday, October 27th. So what is it? Tomorrow will mark the three week anniversary uh, of the portfolio. So, you know, we have a limited performance based uh, real real time performance. This, we back tested this over several years prior to launch. But again, this is the uh, this is the growth investing landing page. So one of the elements you have, as I alluded to, is you have uh, the current portfolio holdings, uh, you know, so it gave you a, a small taste of the stocks that are currently in the growth investing portfolio. Uh, you know, th three of the first five that were added to the portfolio uh, back, uh, the, the alert was issued on the 26th, but I actually bought them on the 27th of October. Our ASML uh, Holding, which is a, a semiconductor company, uh, Mercata Libre Inc., uh, which is sort of the, the Latin American uh, Amazon, uh, and then Star Surgical Company, uh, you know, I, I, I was not aware, uh, you know, but um, actually my mother uh, just uh, used Star Surgical uh, uh, products. Uh, she just had uh, her cataracts done and actually had in the process now they can go in and say, you know, oh, do you want your eyesight improved too, which never knew that. Uh, and she actually had uh, implantable lenses produced, I'm sure, probably by Star Surgical because they are the number one uh, manufacturer of implantable lenses. So you have, um, but on this page you have all 20. So you have your portfolio holdings, uh, you know, with very key information, you can find out immediately if the stock currently qualifies. So if that check mark is there, that means that we would still, it meets all of the criteria to be added to the portfolio. Over time, these check marks might fall off. That doesn't mean we're going to immediately sell them. Uh, we, we do allow some, some weakening of the underlying fundamentals. Um, so just because a company doesn't currently qualify doesn't necessarily mean we're going to turn around and sell it immediately. Um, but, you know, you get the rudimentary G-score, growth grade, quality grade, uh, industry, uh, and then if there's any news items. Then you can track the performance. So we have individual stock performance. Uh, we break down uh, the G-score and the uh, growth grade components uh, as part of the portfolio analysis, uh, and then some additional fundamental criteria and data uh, that are part uh, of the uh, portfolio characteristics. And actually, let me do one thing, probably make this a little, Apologies, I have a finicky laptop tonight that's growing a little. Uh, so Derek, can you see the growth investing website? Yes, I can see the website. I see the uh, latest insight, uh, growth as a long-term investment approach. Okay, so you have you know the portfolio tab uh, where you have your holdings, performance data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We then also have the ideas list, which I can try to make this. So the ideas list, uh, to repeat, uh, these are companies that meet all of the criteria uh, that make up the growth investing strategy. So in theory, any of the stocks that are on this ideas list could be added uh, if, if need be, if we had a sell, they would be the stocks that would be chosen. Uh, this is the group that the, any replacements would be chosen from. Uh, as I said, currently, I think there's around 35 or 40. Um, this is also, you know, 20 stocks is a lot to a lot of people, but, you know, if you look at the 20 stocks 
and aren't satisfied with the stocks that are currently held in the portfolio, then you can come to the ideas list uh, and find some uh, additional stocks that uh, might be better suited or more interesting to you. Um, you know, again, we break down the different elements of the G score uh, and the growth grade. So you can see exactly, you know, what elements uh, of the G score a stock either does or doesn't pass, as well as the different elements uh, of the growth composite. Um, and then lastly, you know, we have uh, the idea characteristics. So, you know, really to give you a decent overview uh, of the, the, the approach, uh, I, what I'd like to do then uh, is give a, an overview uh, of an individual stock uh, using the growth analyzer. Uh, and actually, I'm going to pick Hershey, probably not a company that is on people's radar screen when you start talking about growth stocks but it does meet all of our current criteria. So this is the growth analyzer uh, of growth investing. Uh, and, you know, see, we're already about 50 minutes in. So probably have to go a little bit faster than I would like to, to, to allow for questions. But, you know, you start out, you have the AI growth investing report card. So you can see what the G score and the growth rate is for the, the company in this case, Hershey, the chocolate company. Uh, so it scores a seven out of eight on the G score uh, and 89 out of 100 uh, on the growth grade. You then can see the, in the eight different tests that underlie the G score. Uh, so a check basically means that the company got one point uh, on the eight point scale. Uh, and these elements are looking at a company's uh, a, a given financial metric all but one uh, relative to its industry. So these ratios we're really doing, it's an industry comparison because a lot of these data points uh, are very industry specific. So the, the test is always against uh, a company's respective industry. Uh, so let's just dive through and, and look at the different elements. So the growth grade really is made up uh, of three different parts. Um, it is looking at five-year sales growth, year-over-year -year sales increases over the last five years, and cash from operations over the last five years. And I alluded to this earlier that when you're looking at long-term sales growth, the, the growth grade rewards companies that are in that middle 60%, more that sweet spot, uh, that it's more apt to be sustainable over the long term. Uh, so companies that are in that middle 60% uh, are, are, have a higher composite uh, relatives to companies that are at the, the two extremes or the tails as far as the highest growth or the lowest growth rates. We also then look at year-over-year -year sales increases. So you know, we want to make sure that companies are able to maintain that top-line growth year-over-year. -year. Uh, so basically, you know, if a company, uh, we look at companies over the last five years, um, you know, Companies that have grown their sales in each of the last five years get a higher weighting, much higher weighting relative to companies that have had no increases over the last five years. And then lastly, we look at annual cash from operations. Uh, and again, uh, companies that have positive cash from operations in each of the last five years receive a significantly higher weighting relative to companies that don't. So we can see here uh, that Hershey's five-year sales growth has been roughly 4% a year. So that's in the bottom 36% uh, of the portfolio. So not you know, earth-shattering growth, but definitely growth that should be sustainable over the long term. Um, uh, because it is not one of those extremes though, uh, it is rewarded. So it actually has a, a growth score uh, composite uh, of 63. So this is a classic example. You know, it's in the 36 percentile based on five-year sales growth, but because it's not at the extremes, uh, it's rewarded. So it actually gets a, a bit higher composite when you look at five-year sales growth. So we can see that Hershey has had sales increases uh, in each of the last five years. Uh, so that gives us a score of 87. Now you might notice, just uh, inevitably, this is going to come up. You're going to say, well, okay, had growth five out of the five years, why doesn't it have 100? 
And that's basically because, you know, the technical term is the lumpiness of the data. 87th percentile is the highest percentile uh, because we're only looking at five data points. So the, the data really gets lumped together. Um, but so it's, it is an 87, but it's the highest. Uh, it is still the highest of companies that have a five out of five. Uh, and then, you know, even more pronounced is the fact that even though Hershey's has generated positive cash from operations in each of the last five years, uh, it's composite based on that is 65. Uh, but again, 65 is the highest, but that is the, the lumpiness of that. And so what we do is we take those composite grades, we add them up and we create an average. And then we rank that average uh, again to arrive at the overall percentile that dictates the growth grade. So uh, when it was all said and done, Hershey's growth, gra uh, growth score, overall growth score ranks in the 89th percentile, uh, which translates into an A for very strong. And then we have the eight tests that go into the uh, G-score. And those are broken down into profitability and cash flow, business variability, as well as accounting conservatism. And so when you're looking at profitability and cash flow, we're looking at return on assets, which is net income uh, over total assets, cash flow return on assets, which is cash from operations, uh, Comp divided by total assets, as well as accruals, which compares net income uh, to cash from operations. Um, in the case of ROA and cash flow ROA, uh, Hershey's has metrics that exceed the their respective industry median. So, for example, Hershey's has a return on assets of 14.9 versus the industry median for the food processing industry, which is 3.8. <coughs> The same thing for cash flow ROA, uh, a cash flow ROA of 23.7 relative to the industry media of 1.1. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we look at uh, accruals, which basically uh, is, is the difference between uh, net income uh, and cash from operations. And so uh, if cash from operations uh, exceeds net income, uh, the the higher the the greater the degree that cash from operations exceeds net income uh, points to higher earnings quality uh, less manipulation less less accruals uh, that go into calculating a company's uh, earnings per share uh, in this case uh, Hershey's cash from operations uh, of 2.2 billion exceeds its net income of 1.5 billion so it gets that point then we look at earnings variability. You know, that has become a factor that's looked at quite a bit uh, over the last several years is, you know, the, the volatility uh, of a, a given stock and how it, in its growth. Uh, and here we look at variability in earnings and sales growth. Um, earnings variability, we look at the variance in annual return on assets over the last five years. Sales variability is we look at the annual growth in sales over the, each of the last five years and calculate the variance in that. And then we calc compare those variances to the over that of the overall industry. So we can see that the variance uh, in return on assets over the last five years uh, is 2.1%, which is significantly lower than the industry median of 21.1%. So in this case, lower being lower than the industry median uh, is what we're looking for. Uh, and then we're looking at year-over-year -year sales growth, the variability in that, the variance is 13.1% for Hershey's versus 129.2% for the industry median. So in these both of these cases, uh, we get a check mark for Hershey's. And then lastly, we're looking at accounting conservatism. And here we are looking at a company's expenditures on R&D, capital expenditures, and advertising. And for a company that is expending, uh, spending more on those three elements relative to its total assets than that of its respective industry, they actually are rewarded for that because a company might be spending a lot on R&D, spending a lot on capital expenditures, spending a lot on advertising, uh, which will depress its earnings. But in theory, and academic research points this out, that in the long term, a company that is spending more on R&D, spending more on CapEx, spending more on advertising will actually have 
more sustainable growth going forward. So in these three, we were measuring basically an intensity ratio, which compares R&D, CapEx, or advertising to a company's total assets. So it's sort of normalizing uh, those levels of expenditures and comparing that uh, to its industry. Uh, in two of these three cases, uh, Hershey's uh, intensity is greater than that of its industry. The exception is R&D, which uh, Hershey's does not report R&D expenditures explicitly on its financial statements. So it's not able to be evaluated, so it doesn't get a point for that. So that's ultimately what's keeping Hershey's from being rewarded that eight out of eight is the fact that it doesn't report uh, R&D expenses. So we add up all these check marks and that leads us to seven. And that's why we come up with the G score uh, of seven. So that is you know, a very quick overview of the, the, the primary elements of uh, the, the growth investing uh, approach. Let me see here, let me go back. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the growth investing approach, uh, in the October 2022 journal, uh, I did an article on the AI growth grade. And then in the September 2022 issue of the journal, uh, I did an article on Monerham's G score. So, you know, what I just gave you was a very quick overview of the approach, um, but uh, you can certainly learn more about it, uh, those two key elements, uh, by looking at those two uh, articles there. Um, so, you know, we're coming up on the eight o'clock hour. Uh, so, I, as usual, I talk too much. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, before, inevitably people are going to start dropping off, especially when we go to the QA section. But before you go, you know, I just want to point out that as a thank you for attending uh, this event this evening, uh, we are offering a special charter rate uh, of $97 for a one year subscription to growth investing. Um, we also offer uh, the AI Platinum. Uh, product, which is a bundle. Uh, it is our A plus online investment discovery analysis and tracking tool, as well as all of our premium portfolios. So now the new growth portfolio, uh, as well as dividend investing, BMQ stocks, and the stock supercharge report. You get all of that in a in a discounted bundle. Um, and if you're interested in that, uh, you can call our AI member services at 312 Six seven six forty three hundred. 4300 um, Reason why we don't have an explicit price for this is because uh, if you have an existing product, so if you subscribe to A+, or you subscribe to SSR, um, we will give you a, a, a prorated refund based on that. So we can't, so depending if you have other services already, that will impact what your total price is. Um, but you can go to invest dot ai dot com slash growth hyphen investing hyphen ninety seven hyphen members uh this is in uh your handout as well um but uh with that uh i would like to thank everyone for attending this evening uh and i can open up the floor to uh some questions for the next 10 minutes or so all right definitely thank you wayne that was a great presentation very informative um a lot of questions have come in. Uh, there's definitely some some common themes, so I'll try to try to lump some of the questions uh, together. Uh, people were interested in uh, in your back testing experience with the approach. Mm -hmm. um, I think you may have published some of those results. Where where could people find those results if they were if they were interested in seeing uh, what you did with your back testing? Uh, both of the, those two articles that I alluded to. Uh, before I wrap things up, uh, discuss some of the back testing that was done uh, to arrive at the overall strategy. Uh, obviously, if anyone has any specific questions, uh, you know, feel free to to contact me at wayne at ai.com. But yeah, do provide some of those back testing statistics in those two articles. All right. And there were there were several questions. People were they, they understood you know the twenty. Uh, 20 company portfolio. They were wondering how you you started with the the ideas list and how does a company actually go from the ideas list to to actually be a part of the portfolio? Like what's what's that process? Sure. So when I started when, when we had no companies uh, started with the ideas list, which were the companies that met all of the criteria. My initial sort is by G score. So I look for I was looking at the companies that had 
G scores of eight. Um, and then from there, sorted it by uh, growth grade, growth score. So, I mean, if you're looking, uh, so, you know, that's how I started. So, and I knew I had 20 companies I wanted to buy. Uh, so I started with the highest uh, G score uh, and then those that had the highest growth grades really didn't pay too close of attention when it came to diversification at the industry or sector level. Um, sort of let, let the data take me, uh, let, let the data lead me. Okay, and is that, uh, was that true just for the initial build of the portfolio or, or there, there were a couple of questions about, uh, you know, do you attempt to diversify across different sectors and industries? Uh, well, is that the slide that I showed you, uh, not really, you know, I'm invested, I think, in probably uh, six, five or six different sectors. But, you know, this is a highly concentrated portfolio. Again, like 50% of the portfolio is in technology. Uh, you know, these are this, the nature of the companies that tend to pass anyway. Uh, the, the companies that have these growth characteristics tend to be isolated in, in specific sectors or industries as well. Um, so, you know, basically it was, you know, I was not making decisions to say, okay, oh, I've, I have, you know, four technology stocks already, you know, do I need to find something else? It was basically if, you know, whatever stocks that had the highest growth grades and the highest G scores. Okay. And there were, there were several questions just about in, in general, if you could summarize the, the, the general buy and sell rules for the portfolio, could you uh, give that information to the people? Uh, I mean, the, the explicitly outlined uh, in the handouts, so uh, feel free to to review those. But those those are exactly the the, the buy and sell criteria that were outlined there. Uh, you know, G score uh, of seven or eight, growth grade of A, uh, quality score, uh, quality grade of A or B, uh, and then you know, respective flipping of that deterioration if the G score falls to two or lower, it's deleted. Uh, growth grade of D or lower, oh, and quality grade of F uh, is also then deleted. Okay, all right, that's helpful. Um, and then there were there were a couple of questions uh, that had to do with uh, annual turnover. I don't know if you have any stats that you can provide people with your in your back testing. What what do you foresee the the portfolio turnover to be? Uh, during the 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 paper back testing I, I did i did you know more quantitative back testing uh, over a 20 year period then actually did paper trading over several years uh the the paper trading that i did it was actually you know taking us you know looking at you know picking stocks based explicitly on you know the the ranking that i was talking about and everything like that that seems to indicate that the the, the annual the the average holding period uh is going to be uh, three plus years so, you know, based on that, then, you know, you're looking at a an annual turnover of, you know, 30% or, or lower. Obviously, that would then fall uh, as the uh, the holding period uh, extended out. But uh, the initial data looks like, you know, probably a, no more than annual turnover of, of 30%. Okay. Uh, and there were a couple of questions having to do with, uh, and I'm sure this came up in your, your research when you were first looking at other what other growth products are out there in the market? Um, I guess the, the question really boils down to, you know, how how does AAII's growth investing compare to some of the others that are out there, or what really distinguish distinguishes it from the others? The thing that I think really sets it apart is the growth grade and the fact that it's a composite that actually sort of punishes companies that have the highest absolute growth. Uh, you know, there's a phenomenon called reversion to the mean. Uh, and that is, I think, one of the reasons why a lot of, you know, pure growth strategies fail over time is because they're only looking for the highest growth. And, you know, companies with the highest growth have such unrealistic expectations that any whiff of those expectations not being met, uh, their valuation is going to get cut off at the knees. Um, so I think what really, one of the elements that I think really differentiates um, this is the fact that our growth grade uh, is not rewarding based on absolute growth. So it's really rewarding companies that are exhibiting qualities that will allow them to grow over a longer period of time without necessarily surprising the market based on uh, missed expectations. But then also is the G score. 
I'm only familiar with one other service that really tracks the G-score that is based on academic research. Um, but uh, anyway, that was another intriguing element is looking at these components that sort of uh, evaluate the, the, qual the growth quality uh, prospects uh, of a company. No, I definitely agree that uh, that does seem to be uh, two of the bigger aspects that separate it from some of the other growth uh, products out there. And, and just w one more, you know, I think sometimes when people think growth, they they unfortunately uh, think speculation as well. Um, what would you say about about that? Um, you know, if you if you view speculation based on valuation. I really can't argue with you except to show you, go back to that slide that I showed you that the longer your holding period, the less impactful uh, valuation is going to be over the long term on stock price. Um, so, you know, these are high valuation stocks. So if that's your definition of speculation, I, I can't argue with you. But as far as, you know, beyond that, you know, these are companies that have been around for multiple years. Uh, exhibiting again reasonable growth, not pie in the sky growth. Um, so you know these are companies that uh, you know based on their qualities, their characteristics, uh, I see them being able to with withstand you know business, uh, economic, and market cycles uh, over several years. And I think we just want to be respectful of uh, our participants' time, etc. But I think so. We'll just take. Uh, one last question here, and I, th I think it's a good one. Um, this participant says they're they're new to AAII, and they're just really looking for any suggestions for first steps. They've they've typically only been a, a mutual fund investor, and they're just uh, so. What would you say to someone like that looking to get started? What uh, what do you think their first step should be? I mean, I think you'd want to familiarize yourself. You know, if you're looking to invest in individual stocks, then the first thing you'd want to do is familiarize yourself with any strategy that you might be interested in. Um, you know, does it align with your time horizon, your risk tolerances, uh, everything like that? You know, my rule of thumb is, you know, right off the bat, if you've got money that you're gonna need within the next five years, it shouldn't be in the stock market at all anyway. Uh, so, you know, so make sure you've got that cushion, you know, whether it's, you know, your kid's college education, you know, your initial years of retirement uh, expenses, uh, et cetera. But I mean, first and foremost, it's finding a strategy that you feel comfortable with. You know, there is something to be said about, you know, being able to sleep well at night. Uh, and so it's understanding the strategy that you are going to be following. Because if you don't understand the strategy, then it's very difficult to follow the characteristics or follow the rules regarding that strategy. Because uh, it's like, you know, I don't understand why I shouldn't why I'm picking a stock based on this, or I don't understand why I should sell when this happens in the stock, when the stock, you know, based on these rules. So first and foremost, it's to educate yourself on whatever strategy you're gonna follow. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of them at a association. Some people would say we might have too many, um, but then, you know, you have a, a staff of knowledgeable analysts, uh, you know, find out who the individual uh, portfolio manager is for any strategy you might be interested in. And reach out if you have specific questions. You know that's why myself and Derek. That's one of our. That's that's part of our our paycheck is to to try to uh, answer the questions of of members or or prospective members. Well said, Wayne. I think uh, that's uh, a good point to stop. So uh, I'll pass it over to Jenna. And thanks for taking all those questions, Wayne. Appreciate it. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and uh, again, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Hi everyone, thanks so much for attending. Um, and yeah, I want to thank you know Derek and Wayne for taking their you know time out of their busy schedules to guide us through our new service, AAII Growth Investing. It was great to see a, an inside look. Um, and but before we go, I do want to mention again that our charter rate is exclusive for those who attended tonight's presentation. So please let us know if you have any questions. Uh, you can learn more about how to get AAII Growth Investing for $97 for one year by following the link listed in the presentation handout. Um, and then if you can also uh, call the number that is on the handout as well uh, to talk to our member services team. They can help you with any membership questions you have, um, especially if you want to look into uh, you know, bundling uh, a few pre uh, premium products uh, under AAII Platinum. And uh, again, I just want to reiterate, if you have any questions about the AAII growth investing portfolio or the strategy or anything that we talked about today, 
uh, please feel free to email Wayne directly at wayne at aaii.com. And then for all other questions um, and membership inquiries, please email members at aaii.com. And if you're looking to join other investors who want to discuss growth strategies or anything or growth stocks, um, feel free to check out our online community at community.aaii.com. Um, and I will include the direct link to the growth investing community in the links and resources uh, shared tomorrow with the recording. And just to kind of go off of that and mention again, this presentation is recorded and a replay of the webinar will be available tomorrow on AAII's YouTube channel, uh, along with links to this presentation's handouts, as well as all of the resources that we discussed tonight. And it'll also be on um, AAII.com slash webinars. Uh, the handout is also available um, on that page as well. Uh, so with that, we wish all of you viewing good health, good fortune, and a great evening. Thank you and take care.